we're gonna get started and see people come. Um, yeah. Oh, I mean, like even if they don't come, it's gonna get recorded. Yeah, yeah. We're we're doing a webinar. So welcome to Direct Democracy 101 for Dummies. Uh, we want to introduce to you today uh, really the basics of direct democracy, what are good tools, uh, how do they work, and then go to the presentation, and then maybe answer some questions from the Um, and we work with activists all over the world, we work with experts um, on direct democracy. And so today we'll introduce to you uh, a general typology of direct democracy, which I will go to now. So at Democracy International, we have developed a tool called the Direct Democracy Navigator. That's a, a global database collecting all legal instruments uh, pertaining to direct democracy. So every country, every, co uh, every communality, every region, and even every uh, transnational organization, it's only one that has direct democracy tools, uh, has been collected in there and in the direct, in the direct democracy navigator. Um, you, can, uh, you can consult what different legislations look like. Uh, we, ca we categorize them in different, um, in different types of direct democracy. Um, you can find all of the basic information, how many votes do you need, uh, who gets to decide, uh, how does it work in the direct democracy navigator. And so today we will present a couple of cases, a couple of direct democracy cases uh, based on this direct democracy navigator typology. Welcome. <laughs> we just got started. Um, yeah, and so um, before we really dive into the, to the actual case studies, we want to look a little bit at um, what does direct democracy mean? What different kinds of tools exist? Which types of direct democracy uh, exist? So this is a, an example from the direct democracy navigator uh, from Mexico, I believe, um, where you can see, you know, the direct democracy navigator tells you how many how many signatures do you need to uh, to initiate to initiate the legislative process? Uh, what does the legal text say? On which uh, level of, of, of uh, legislation does it work? Does it, is it constitutional? Is it on a lower level? Um, yeah, and so we classify all, this, all of these different types of direct democracy instruments based on um, on three three main um, axes: is who writes the legislation, so uh, who is actually the author of a, of a of a of a law. Is it the citizens or is it a representative authority? So a representative authority in this case would be the parliament or the government. Um, who initiates a legislation process? So in, in representative democracy, it is the lawmaker. It's usually the parliament initiating the legislative process. Um, but there are instruments, direct, so direct democracy instruments are of course instruments involving citizens. Um, so who initiates it? Is it citizens? Is it a representative authority? Or is it automatically triggered in specific cases? Um, this last one is, for example, the case in many countries, if you want to change the constitution, um, then automatically a referendum is triggered. Uh, so this is, this is what we call an obligatory referendum. Um, then the second sort of, or the third marker is who makes the decision in the end, right? Um, so is it, does the law that was written and inis initiated by citizens go to the parliament to make a decision on it? In that case, it would be an agenda setting initiative. 
Um, are it the citizens who vote on it in a referendum? In that case, it's a citizens-initiated referendum. In the case where it's written and initiated by a representative authority, so by the parliament or by the government, uh, but the citizens decide, we call it a plebiscite. Um, and in the, in the case where it's automatically triggered and the citizens decide, it's an obligatory referendum. So all of these types of direct democracy tools are tools where citizens are involved either in writing the legislation, in, um, in, in initiating the legislation or in voting on the legislation, whether or not it passes or not. Um, but not all of these tools um, are equally good practice uh, and not all of these tools are uh, used in the same way around the world. And so today we want to look a little bit at um, how these tools are used in different ways in different countries um, and what's good practice and what's bad practice. And we'll give some good examples and some bad examples. Um, yeah. And so INA at Mere Demokratie. Mere Demokratie is the biggest organization in the world working on direct democracy, so they, um, they really know what are the quality markers of good direct democracy processes, and Ina will explain that a little bit now. Thanks a lot. Yeah, uh, as I said, we are a professional organization, so we really focus on um, yeah, what, is, what, is, uh, what is the, um, like the quality criteria for direct democracy. And as a first start, we, um, well, we are very strict with the term of direct democracy. So we said that um, direct democracy is the only way for citizens to become independent from governmental decisions. So our criteria for the term of direct democracy is, first of all, it needs to deal with a substantive issue. So recall elections are not direct democratic and are like not called direct democracy in uh, the mere democratic view. Um, they need to be triggered by law or by citizens. So we, um, we say that direct democracy is not if a government wants to uh, reassure their own uh, power or their own decisions. And um, last but not least, it needs to be binding. So the outcome of the citizens' initiative must have the same weight of um, a parliamentary decision. So um, yeah, in our understanding, uh, there are only like three of the four instruments listed here are like real direct democratic. It's like the citizens' initiative referendum, um, the obligatory referendum, and like a special case, the citizens' initiative referendum. This is like a, a facultative re referendum is like in the same. Yeah. Can maybe you switch to the next? <laughs> ah, okay, sorry. Okay, so just a step back. Okay, so there was uh, like a, um, one slide. It's, it's, uh, it's fine. Okay, so uh, I um, yeah, go on with how we measure the quality of direct democracy. And uh, the first one um, is, are there clear legal regulations? So if it's fixed somewhere in the constitution, in the law, that um, what kind of quorum needs to be met? Uh, is there a deadline? What kind of topics can be dealt with? Um, what are the requirements for collecting signatures? And uh, what question can be asked? And um, well, the second question uh, on the quality of direct democracy is, like I said before, has or is the outcome of the direct democratic initiative has the same political bite as a, um, a parliament's decision and can the same topics a parliament can decide on can be decided on from the citizens as well or can be demanded from the citizens as well. Um, then well, we look at the quorum or quorums that direct democracy has. So we have two kinds. It's one of how many signatures needs to be collected. And there we ask um, if, if the number of required signatures is realistically reachable for the, for the citizens. So if it's not too high and uh, on the other side, not too low because you need a critical amount of signatures to show that the topic um, really is an important one. And um, yeah, when we come to voting forums, um, this is like, um, they, for example, a voting forum is that you don't need only like the majority of people saying yes to something, but it needs a, diff, um, a certain share of citizens participate in the uh, referendum so it um, be valid. And uh, well, we as Mere Demokratie criticize these kind of forums because we say that people um, who are not gonna uh, vote in favor or that, um, yeah, who, don't, who want the referendum to fail could just stay at home, so uh, not enough people go and vote. And the last criteria is, um, yeah, are the deadlines, because deadlines are crucial for success. Deadlines need to be long enough, so 
the um, collection of signatures is possible, um, and also longer uh, processes um, and different steps in the uh, different uh, kind of direct democratic initiatives um, prevent uh, from quick, uh, like quick shots and rush decisions. with the first example. So here we come to the uh, cases of uh, where we see direct democratic initiatives. And the first example I brought is from Berlin, uh, from Germany, my home country. And actually in Berlin, there was an agenda setting initiative for a citizens assembly on climate in Berlin. And um, yeah, just a little reminder, citizens initiative, uh, agenda setting initiative, sorry, um, is not what we call direct democracy, because uh, it does not lead to a referendum. It only leads uh, to, or it only, um, yeah, uh, the, it only um, makes the uh, House of Deputies to deal with it, to decide on it. But if they reject this, there is no referendum following. So um, still, I, I brought the example of uh, Klima Neustadt Berlin on a citizens' assembly on um, climate. And um, in Berlin, the legal regulations are that at least 2,000, uh, 20,000 valid handwritten signatures need to be collected. Um, they can be collected freely, like on the street. Um, and anyone who is 16 years old or older can um, sign. And um, a quite progressive law, uh, nationality or ability to vote is not important, so everyone can sign such a referendum or such an um, agenda setting initiative. And um, yeah, in our case, the, uh, as I said, the organization standing behind this initiative for um, Citizens' Assembly on Climate was Klima Neustadt Berlin. Um, it is, they, these people are kind of active in Berlin because um, like at the same time they um, started um, a citizens' initiative for uh, Berlin becoming climate neutral. So this is like the binding process and they've started an agenda setting initiative before um, that Berlin declares to, um, uh, to proclaim uh, emerg climate emergency in Berlin. And they were successful um, as well. And one of Mehrdemokratie state associations, uh, Mehrdemokratie Berlin Brandenburg, they were one of the, um, one of the supporting organizations of the uh, agenda setting initiative. So uh, like Marie, for example, who was at the panel before. And, um, yeah, the collection of signatures started in 2020, so it was right uh, at the same time at the corona pandemic, like in the middle of the corona pandemic, they started collecting signatures, but still, um, yeah, they were successful, and what they were asking for was a climate assembly, so um, a citizens assembly where randomly selected people that uh, built like a mini Berlin um, in their, um, yeah, like, well, they build a mini Berlin, they come together to discuss what Berlin can do to become climate neutral um, or to protect uh, yeah, the climate. And um, the model was the Citizens' Assembly on Climate in France. So there was a Citizens' Assembly before. And um, yeah, on December the 2nd, more than um, 32,000 signatures were handed over to the Berlin House of Deputies. This is where this photo comes from. Um, I think on all of these boxes are uh, lists with um, signatures. And well, they handed it over and the uh, House of Deputies, well, they discussed about it and there were many um, talks between the initiative and the House of Deputies. Um, it was not binding, so it wouldn't lead to a referendum, but still, um, well, the House of Representatives voted in favor of implementing, implementing a citizens' assembly. Um, but then there was like an election between, so it was quite unclear if um, the citizens' assembly will take place. But uh, still, uh, also after the election took place, it was installed. And from uh, April to June 2022, um, 100 randomly selected Berliners met to discuss um, on climate actions. And the result um, were like 47 recommendations on climate action policies and 30, uh, 43 of them were also adopted fully. So we would say this is a huge success um, of this initiative. Yeah, and then maybe if we can go to the next slide, thank you. <laughs> I love how we've enlisted somebody from the audience to <laughs> manage our slideshow. Just the arrow, yeah. 
Yeah, thank you. Um, yes, so as Ina said, um, so we're, I'm still presenting an example of an agenda setting initiative. So this means that citizens write the law or initiate the, the law making process, but they don't get to decide in the end. Um, so so this, is, this is any kind of initiative where people collect signatures and then depose it to a representative authority. It can be the city council, the city parliament. It can be the national parliament. Many countries in the world have petition instruments, right? Germany has a petition instrument. I think the British petition instrument in the parliament is very well known. But in the end, it's the parliament that makes the decision. Um, and actually, the only tool of direct democracy, and, and again, we have to... Um, when citizens don't make the decision, we, we don't really like to talk about direct democracy. But this is, there is an example uh, in the European Union, which is the only example of where citizens are involved in lawmaking on a transnational level. Um, so not just in their country, but on the, on the regional transnational level. So in the European Union, um, if you collect one million signatures in at least seven member states in the space of a year time, uh, the Commission, the European Commission, which is basically the equivalent of a government in a, in, in, in a, in a country, um, promises to, uh, to express themselves on that. And so they don't promise that they, that they will put into action what the citizens have proposed, uh, but they promise that they will look at it, and if they, if they think it's suitable, they will put it into action. And so this shows you already that this, of course, has, that is a tool that has limit, limitations, right? Because when you go to the as a civil society organization, collecting one million signatures is an, is an enormous effort. It costs a lot of money, costs a lot of time. You need to build a big alliance of, of, of organizations to help you do this in seven countries in the, in the European Union with um, over 20 different languages. Um, so it's... So it's it's something that's very, very difficult, and in the end, you're not sure if something is going to happen with it. Nevertheless, the, the European Citizens Initiative, as this is called, um, is, is, is kind of a success story. Um, it's been ex in existence uh, for 10 years, um, and there's been um, yeah, almost 100 citizens, European Citizens Initiatives, six of which, uh, no, sorry, 11 of which have managed to reach the threshold of 1 million signatures, so this very high, difficult threshold to reach, um, and six of which has, have been answered by the European Commission, so three of them are still being processed. Uh, the European Commission is counting if, all, if they ha really do have one million signatures and so on. Um, and so this example that I brought is NDKH. This was the last one to reach one million signatures. Um, and it was uh, an initiative to basically end factor factory farming. So to make, um, to make the conditions of, of farm animals who are being raised, um, I don't know, for... Um, for their meat or for, for eggs or for milk to make the condition in which they live better in all of Europe. So it's a Europe-wide directive. Um, and this is the first time that the European Commission actually reacted by saying immediately on the day that the one million signatures were verified, we're going to implement this. We're going to change this over all of Europe. Um, so, so depending on the authority which receives the, the signatures, you see that um, there are cases where, where it really can be success stories. Um, of course, Nobody votes on this. One million people in the entire European Union, there's 500 million people living in the European Union, they're not a majority. So the commission weighs whether or not they think that this is something that carries the majority of, of European citizens, but they don't know because there is no vote on it. Um, nevertheless, it's a tool that's allowed uh, civil society in Europe to really connect across borders, ac across topics. It's something that's, um, that's really helping build also a European sphere of, um, of discussion, of, of, of political discussion, um, and, and of civil society around different topics. So, so it's, not, it's not a bad tool, it's not a perfect tool, but it's also a tool that's done a lot of good. Um, yeah. And then I think we will go to the, to the next slide. Ah, which is... Again. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, so my next case is uh, a citizens' initiative. It's the citizens' initiative um, Save the Bees from Bavaria. This is one of the German states as well. And um, citizens' initiatives, as we said before, can be used to implement laws by the citizens. And, um, the, but the legal uh, regulations, like they change from state to state in Germany, and the ones we have in Bavaria are kind of strict. Uh, but however, they have a kind of lively um, praxis of direct democracy on state level. So, um, for a citizen's initiative to become effective in Bavaria, you need at least to request, or at the starting point to request um, the citizen's initiative. You need 
uh, at least um, 25,000 signatures from um, Bavarian citizens. You can collect them wherever you want, like on the streets in uh, some kind of uh, markets or something else. Um, but only those who are um, eligible to vote in Bavaria can sign the request for the citizens' initiative. And these um, signatures need, needs to be collected within two years. Um, then you hand them over, the uh, signatures, to the um, parliament, at, or to the Bavarian Ministry of the Interior, and they examine within six weeks if um, the law is, the citizens' initiative is um, legally admissible. Uh, so not in kind of, um, if they want it or not, but if, like, in legal terms, it's, it's uh, well, admissible. So uh, if the Ministry of the Interior gives their permission to the initiative, the collection of signatures start. And this is like the hard point in the Bavarian, um, yeah, in the Bavarian law, because citizens must sign into the lists within 14 days. The lists are only available at municipal um, buildings like city halls. So um, you have to wait in line. This, so this is what the picture shows. It's uh, where people are waiting in line to sign, a ref uh, to sign the um, citizens' initiative, and it needs 10% of the Bavarian um, voters, and this is like, like 950,000 people. And in the case presented, uh, it's a citizens' initiative for biodiversity, and uh, it was implemented by a German party, actually, um, the Ecological Democratic Party, but later it was um, supported by many other different um, organization that aims for nature conservation. And uh, the demand of the referendum of the Citizens Initiative was to anchor regulations to the Bavarian Nature Conservation Act that saves biodiversity, so it's Save the Bees in Bavaria. And, um, well, the history is, this was a kind of really successful story because um, it happened in 2018, and um, like, the like I said, the first step was 25,000 signatures and 94, thousand uh, citizens also sign, uh, already signed for the request for citizens initiative so they saw that there were a lot of people interested um, in this initiative and well it got it got the legal permission from the ministry of the interior so from january to february 2019 all bavarian voters had the chance to sign in for the citizens initiative and an unbelievable number of 1.8 million citizens signed well, this was 1.8 million citizens actually waiting in front of the city halls to get the signatures in. They're waiting for hours um, in parts, and yet they still said, this is so important for me. I want to go, I want to sign in. And it was and snowing. Hmm? And it was snowing. Yeah, I, I think the picture didn't show, it, it was in winter, so it was, it was terribly cold then. Uh, but still, people dressed up as bees to, to um, like get people um, informed. And uh, I think this is also, also um, interesting because, yeah, as we uh, heard before, that one of the biggest problems of direct democracy is get people informed, and somehow they um, yeah, managed it to get 1.8 million people informed that they have a right to sign in um, for the Citizens' Initiative. And, um, well, as I said, they um, passed the hurdle uh, easily, so there was 18% of the Bavarian voters who signed in for the initiatives initiative and um, so the Bavarian state parliament has like three options to go. They could accept the bill, they could reject the bill and it comes to a referendum or the third, third case is that they um, like contest the legal validity of the bill but this would be leads to long um, reviews of the Bavarian constitutional code in the long process and although the state government has rejected the law um, beforehand um, they have changed their opinion totally after they see the law, uh, after they have seen the large turnout from the voters that signed in for the initiative. So um, the Bavarian State Parliament has passed the law with a um, huge majority uh, in July 2019, and um, yeah, both, uh, they, the law went into effect on August, 1st of August 2019. And what I think is uh, also s uh, nice, nice news or good news that um, many other German states uh, looked at this example of the Bavarian Save the Bees initiative and started own initiatives for, um, yeah, for nature, to, to preserve nature and diversity. Yeah. 
And so I want to present uh, the next case, which is uh, Switzerland, which is really the gold standard of direct democracy, if you want. Uh, so in Switzerland, um, of course, there is a parliament, there is a government. They do what parliaments and governments do. Um, but you also have the possibility as a citizen, as a citizen so if you think of our, our sort of columns, to write laws, to initiate a legislation process, and to vote on them. So um, in Switzerland, if you collect uh, 100,000 signatures, which is not a very high hurdle, so in Switzerland has 8 million inhabitants, um, then you can trigger a referendum. So if you can find 900... Uh, 99,999 other people who agree with you on a topic, then you can make everybody vote on it. Um, and so I, the, case I, the case I pick now is, is uh, something that I found really, really interesting because this was in the middle of the pandemic. So this was in 2021 uh, when the whole, the whole world was on lockdown. Everybody was thinking about, um, about our healthcare system. Um, every, <laughs> obviously, our hospitals were overflowing. Uh, and in many countries, um, there, were, there were reactions that were made sort of based on the idea of this is what we think um, the people want. But in Switzerland, they knew what the people want because people started collecting signatures to actually massively improve the healthcare system. Um, and so this, um, the healthcare, uh, so Pflege Initiative, the CARE initiative um, was voted on in, in 2021. Um, in the middle of the pandemic, um, and it was uh, big reforms to the financing of the healthcare system, to how uh, nurses are being, uh, how nurses are trained in Switzerland, um, how doctors are trained, um, to make it easier to get more professionals uh, into the healthcare sector and to to improve their working conditions. And so, where in other parts of the world, we you know you saw this sort of authoritarian reflex: we have to protect our healthcare system. The only way we can do this efficiently is with you know, a strong leader um, who tells us how to do that. In Switzerland, they did the, other, they, they did the complete opposite. They had a, a bottom-up approach. They, they, they had a, what this also leads to, because it's a long signature collect collection process, it leads to the fact that you know, people discuss about this. It's, it's, uh, and of course, in the pandemic, this was a topic that was on everybody's mind. And so um, people were very informed about this. What also happens in Switzerland, maybe what I should mention, um, is that when you when you've managed to collect enough signatures and your, um, your, your initiative is tabled for a vote, so everybody will get to vote on it, there's four voting days every year. Those dates are known in advance and then the topics are slated depending on uh, when enough votes come in. Um, and what happens is that um, the initiative, the initiators, so the people who, who came up with the idea, you know, in this case the CARE initiative, they get to list their, their so they, they make their case, they say, we think that this is important for this and this and this reason. Uh, but then you also get the, the, the opinion of the government. So the government uh, gives an official opinion on whether or not they think this is a good idea, whether or not they think it's financeable, whether or not they think it's implementable. Um, and every Swiss citizen gets sent to their home a booklet that has all of this information in there. So how much, how much would it cost? It, does the government think it's a good idea? What do the other parties think of it? What do the initiators say? What are the pro and cons? of this initiative. And then on voting Sunday, one of the four voting Sundays in a year, um, Swiss people go to vote. Um, in this case, it was 65% of Swiss people who voted and 60% of people voted in favor. That may not sound like a lot, but this is also what Ina explained before. We don't need a 99% turnout. We want the people who are interested in this topic to come out and to say whether or not they're in favor or they're not in favor. Um, what some topics are just not relevant to everybody. Like for example, in Switzerland, this is my other favorite example from Switzerland, they also voted a couple of years ago on um, should farmers be allowed to cut the horns of, their, of the cows? Um, and so, um, you know, animal rights activists were saying that, it is, it, no, 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 it is very important. <laughs> so animal rights activists were saying that, you know, um, cows need them for defense. And farmers were saying, if we keep, if cows, if we let cows keep their horns, they injure each other. Um, and so, while so, while this is a very important topic, and some people are very passionate about it, I personally probably would not have gone to vote on that Sunday because I, I, I don't know on which side of this issue I land. And so, that is also totally fine not to have an opinion on it. The, what matters is that the people who do have an opinion on it go out and vote, and that we have a good estimate of whether or not those people are in favor or against something. Um, 
And one more thing, maybe um, in Switzerland there are there are two kinds of citizens-initiated referendums. Um, so one is where you come up with your own new idea. You say you you identify a lack in legislation, so the parliament is not acting on a topic. Often this is climate. <laughs> Unfortunately, in a lot of places in the world, um, often you see that governments or parliaments are not really doing something about climate, and then citizens have to go come into action and um, collect signatures and, and put something on the ballot. But what is also possible in Switzerland is to vote, is to collect signatures against a law that the parliament has already made. So if the parliament has passed a law that you don't agree with, you have 100 days, I believe, in Switzerland, but I have to look at the experts here. It's about 50. <laughs> it's, no. I think it's 100. <laughs> yeah, so you have 100 days. So you have 100 days to collect 50,000 signatures to convince 49,999 people that this is not a good law, and then also a referendum is triggered. Um, and so this is really a case where you know citizens decide what which topics are important to them, and citizens decide where they land on those topics. And so that is really um, sort of not that Switzerland is perfect, <laughs> but this is sort of the the gold standard of, of direct democracy. <laughs> and cheese. Okay, so is it my turn now? I think so. No, I don't know. No, it's it's Carol again. <laughs> Sorry, I will stop talking after this. Um, yeah. So um, right. So so this is a this is a, a local example in Switzerland. This is Luzerne, where the global forum took place last year. Um, it's a it's a very tiny, small, picturesque town by the lake with the mountains, as you can you know, imagine from Switzerland. Um, and last year, when we were there during the forum in September, they had a, sort of an, an interesting case that doesn't really exist in many other places in the world. It's where you have two proposals up for a vote, and people get to choose which one of those proposals they prefer. Um, so in Luzerne, the, the, the city government had decided on a climate strategy that they, that they proposed to the citizens and that, that they wanted to pass. But the opposition parties in the parliament um, launched a counter proposal. So they thought that the, the proposal of the city was too, too far reaching, that it would cost too much money. And so the opposition launched a mild version of the climate proposal. And so you had two competing climate proposals on the ballot. And so then citizens in, in Switzerland, we, can, we have the ballot, I think, with the question, um, can choose. So, OK, do you? Do you like the climate strategy of the city? Yes, okay. Do you like the counter strategy? Also good, fine. So which one of those do you prefer? So you can be in favor, you can actually say, I'm in favor of both the city, gov <laughs> the city government's proposal and the opposition's proposal, but then in the end, you have to decide which one you think is better. Um, and so this is, a, this is sort of a, a little quirk of direct democracy that I also wanted to share with you. And now I think, uh, <laughs> yeah, um, so my last case is uh, like the facultative referendum Carol has talked about uh, a few minutes ago. This is where the citizens can put a parliament or put a law that has passed the parliament into a referendum. Um, like we said before, uh, collect 50,000 uh, valid signatures within 100 days. And um, in total, there were 207 facultative referendums, so it's not something that happens like with every law that is passed in the parliament. Um, I think Bruno said before, it's like 1% of the laws um, that pass the parliament. And uh, in, from these 207 laws um, that were tested, 120, 120 passed, so it's not like uh, that much laws are getting rejected as well. So, um, my case, uh, the case I'm going to present, to present um, was um, a new regulation on organ donorship. So, um, it, uh, finally, it started out with a citizen's initiative that has collected signatures to um, turn the uh, law of organ donorship from um, that you need to sign in, and to, you have, uh, in Germany we have this little card where you sign, if I die, you can have my organs, um, or ask whatever my husband, my parents, my children, which organs you can use, um, to like the opposite around. So like everyone is an organ donor, 
And if you don't want to donor your organs uh, when you die, you have to have this little card where you say, no, I don't want to be an organ donor. Because um, the number of organ donors is very, very low, I think, um, at the whole world. And um, yeah, so there was a citizen's initiative that was, um, they uh, wanted to implement a law on organ donorship. They uh, um, collected the signatures, they gave it to the parliament, and the parliament said, this is kind of good. We don't want it as strictly as you uh, have um, drafted your law. They came up with a different law that, um, because it met the, like the, big, um, the big deals of the citizens' initiative, they said, okay, so we take a step back. We don't want to get it to a referendum. You just passed the law that um, yeah, it's like a compromise, and then we're done. So the parliament has decided to um, yeah, adopt the, comp uh, the compromise law on the organ donorship, and then there was a citizens' initiative um, that wanted a... Um, yeah, like a, a facultative referendum, they said, oh, no, I, we don't want to become um, organ donorship automatically. We want to put this to a referendum. So, um, yeah, they collected the signatures within the 100 days, and um, they say, uh, collected like 55,000 signatures, so like 5,000 more than they needed. And um, the referendum was actually held uh, in May last year, and um, the voter turners was much less, it was 40%, but still 60% uh, of the electorates said that they want this law to be passed. So, um, yeah, the new law is planned to become effective in 2025. Um, yeah, and so it's like, it's like a, a success for the citizens' initiative before, and it shows how different kind of direct democratic instruments can actually work together and uh, come effective in the same process of legislation. Yay. So this is, of course, not my picture. <laughs> so I didn't bring a picture because I'm going to talk about something that does not exist yet because it has never happened. And I'm very sad to report that this is uh, an example of a very bad practice when it comes to referendums. So Mexico City is um, just, just put any picture. Don't worry. <laughs> Yeah, this looks like Mexican people. <laughs> okay. Maybe not this one. <laughs> Maybe not this one. Uh, anyway, don't worry. Don't worry about the about the <laughs> about the picture. So Mexico City has a new participation, a citizens participation law that was enacted in 2019, and it's supposed to be like super progressive and you know um, really opening up the rights of the citizens to direct democracy, among other things. And one of the things that, it, they, that they included is uh, called referendum. So according to this law, we as citizens have the right to contest any law initiative at any level that happens here in Mexico City. Okay, so if, we want, if the Congress just changed the Constitution to do something we don't like, we can start a referendum. Or if they just passed a new law, or they changed an existing law, we can activate our referendum. Sounds good, right? Haha, -ha, wait, wait until I give you the details. Okay, so according to this law, this referendum procedure can be started by two instances, okay? One of them is the Congress. So why would the Congress initiate a referendum on a law they just passed? is a question that I really don't know how to answer. But the Congress can initiate a referendum by having two-thirds of the Congress vote in favor of this referendum to contest the law that they just passed by majority, right? Makes sense? Yes, okay, so that's one of the instances that can start a referendum. And the other one is the citizens. Okay, so this looks promising, right? Okay, so we as citizens, can say like, hey, I don't like that law that makes me an organ donor by definition. I wanna contest it, right? Okay. So if you're a, if you're a citizen who wants to fight a law or a law, um, a new law or a reform to an existing law, what do you have to do? So you have to gather signatures, of course. You have to gather around 100,000 signatures. Now, here's, here's the good news. This law is so badly written that it has no time frame. 
So you don't have a limit on the days that you need to, to gather the signatures on. So I, like, legally I could contest any law that has been passed by the Mexico City Congress after 2019. That's a good, that, that, that's good news, right? Okay. The problem comes, <laughs> the problem comes when you actually like gather the signatures um, these signatures, they will go through a process of authentication. I know that, uh, you know, like democracy outside Mexico is based on trust. Democracy inside Mexico is based on we don't trust anyone, right? So if we are uh, gathering signatures, there is going to be a very thorough uh, review of these signatures. So they have to check one by one that these signatures are number one, authentic, and number two, that they correspond to who they say they correspond. How do they do that? Because we have this uh, very big list that INE has, uh, that has your name and that has your signature. So they have to check each of them and see whether like, you are really supporting this. Okay, that's, 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 that's okay, that's good, okay. So once the signatures have been verified and they have been counted and you, really uh, have collected everything you need, your petition for a referendum goes to the Congress. So the Congress <laughs> gets it and the Congress can reject it, period. That's the end of your referendum, right? So that's why, <laughs> that is why this has never happened in Mexico City. Um, and then of course, yeah, it says like, okay, so if the Congress wants your referendum to proceed, then you can proceed and then you will have to have at least one third of the, peop of the eligible voters vote uh, for or against, like, I mean like vote in your referendum and then the decision will be binding, which is great. Um, and there's also a limit on the things that you can subject to referendum. So you cannot have a referendum on things that have to do with human rights, which I support with criminal law or with taxes. Hmm. Yes. So I mean I think I think it's this is this is it comes from good intentions, I wanna believe, but as it is, it's totally impossible to have this happen, right? So I don't know, maybe we could have a citizens initiative <laughs> to change this because I mean, I, I, would, I would like to exercise my, my right to, to a referendum, but well. So that's, that's, the, first, uh, that's the first example of a um, bottom-up citizen-initiated referendum uh, that I brought to you today. The second one is not as, as interesting because it's not from Mexico. <laughs> the second one happened in Colombia. So in Colombia, in 2016, there was a consultation, well they call it the Consulta Popular Anticorrupción, which in our classification is a citizen initiated, no, sorry, it's a top-down plebiscite. Plebiscite? Plebiscite? Plebiscite. Un plebiscite. Okay, so what, what, was, what was this about? So people were very frustrated with corruption in Colombia, and um, there was this political movement that wanted to have, you know, like stricter rules against corruption. So they started this consulta and uh, they needed a lot of signatures which they collected to have a referendum uh, on anti-corruption. And this is, this is a very um, sad example, I guess, because they needed 33.3% of participation from the eligible voters, and they got 32.04. So they were like about to make this happen. Um, the questions on the ballot were very specific, and they had to do <laughs> with stricter regulations uh, around corruption. So for example, the first question said, do, are you, do you agree that we should reduce the salary of Congress people from 40 to 25 minimum wages? Um, and by the way, all, all these questions, they were like highly voted towards yes. So this would have happened if like maybe, I don't know, 10,000 more people went out to vote. 
Um, then the second one uh, had to do with like stricter penalties or stricter uh, like jail times for people who were found guilty of corruption. So apparently before, well, I mean, like apparently in Colombia, people who were guilty of corruption could serve, you know, like um, in their, like in home, no, that instead of, of in prison, they could go to like their houses or they could go to like different uh, facilities. So in this, in this referendum, what people wanted to do is to make it impossible for people who have been charged with corruption to uh, spend time anywhere but like federal prisons of like super maximum security. Um, well, things like that. So since uh, this, this was a very controversial uh, referendum, in the end, the government kind of have, you know, like a, like a consulta um, in which uh, he, well, it was not a consultation. So, so he, he brought these topics before the Congress and some of them were approved, some of them were not approved. So for example, um, people who are guilty of corruption, they have to stay in jail. They cannot like um, change their, their, like they cannot get exceptions because of good behavior or something like that. Um, they also approve that every congressperson has to be like very transparent and they have to uh, submit, you know, like a declaration of how, um, like how much money they have before they become congress people um, and things like that. So this is, I, I think, I think this is a, a very good example of what we can do when we actually like come and use these mechanisms. And it was really a bummer <laughs> that it didn't go through. Now I'm going to give the mic to Carol. Thank you. And I will take the, the next one. Yes. Um, so um, we also, we brought some, I mean, we're mixing them in now, but we have some bad examples as well. But this is a good example, the last one, um, of an obligatory referendum. So an obligatory referendum, if you think of our sort of typology, is um, nothing that is initiated by citizens or not even, um, well, it can be initiated by citizens, um, but it, it, an obligatory referendum is a case when, in certain cases, when the law specifies in this cases, we have to have a referendum. So if you want to, often it is, if you want to change the constitution of our country, then everybody needs to vote on it, which is something that makes a lot of sense. Um, and so this um, is the case, for example, lots of countries actually have this law, not a lot of countries put it into practice because often parliaments avoid changing the constitution, it's very difficult and they don't want to have referendums. <laughs> um, but in Ireland, um, they, they've had a number of constitutional referendums in the, in the past year. So in Ireland, if you want to change a constitution, you have to have a, a popular vote on it. Um, and in the past years, you may have heard in Ireland, they voted on, um, on legalizing same-sex marriage. They voted on taking, um, so the constitution spec in Ireland up until two or three years ago specified that you were not allowed to get a divorce. Um, that blasphemy was uh, unconstitutional, so cursing uh, against God could get you into, <laughs> into trouble in Ireland. Um, and you're also not allowed to have abortions, um, which led a lot of women to, um, to, to have them illegally or to, to have to leave the country to, uh, to have an abortion or to order medication online, um, which, is, which is then outside of all sort of medical supervision and, and, and actually quite dangerous. Um, and so um, what happened in Ireland is here we have a picture of um, Savita. Savita is a, is a woman who had a medical complication and she died actually waiting for medical help because the doctors were afraid to help her because they thought um, that by helping her you know, get, you know, end a miscarriage, uh, they would be performing a, an abortion. And so she, she died out of, of, this, um, of this emergency. It started a huge movement in Ireland um, to decriminalize abortion because the constitution said in Ireland, we don't have abortions, which is of course not true. Um, and um, this movement sort of uh, made it happen that, that this was a topic that's really on everybody's mind. And what happened then in Ireland is they had a citizens assembly. So the citizens assembly is also what the, like the example that Ina explained uh, in Berlin, is where they, they randomly select citizens. So in this case, it was 99 citizens um, and a president. 
um, who were selected to, to be representative of Irish population in terms of gender. So they were as many, the, the same percentage of women and men in the, in the citizens' assembly as in the general population. They were looking at age, they were looking at education um, and, and some, um, some other um, criteria. Um, and this citizens' assembly was given certain topics by the parliament. So the parliament decided which were going to be the topics that the citizens' assembly was going to talk about. Um, and one of them was abortion. Abortion, Ireland is a very Catholic, a very religious country, um, is a topic that for political parties was really something that they did not want to touch because they did not want to upset any voters. And so by giving it to the citizens and giving it to the citizens' assembly, they were able to, to sort of neutralize this topic because normal citizens are talking about this, right? They don't have political party affiliations. Nobody's voting for them. They're just speaking their minds. And they came up with a recommendation to change the constitution. And because of that recommendation, the parliament then decided to write an, a new provision for the constitution, decriminalizing abortion. Um, and because they wanted to change the constitution, they had to have a vote. Um, and so it, I believe it was 62% of Irish people voted in that referendum um, to take the criminalization of abortion out of the constitution. Um, and so this is um, how that happened in Ireland. Uh, the, the same happened, as I said, with uh, same-sex marriage, with blasphemy, with divorce. Um, small caveat, the, the fact that abortion was in the Irish constitution is also the result of a referendum that happened a very long time ago. <laughs> um, but, um, so yeah, this is, um, this is just an example that, that, um, that shows you, yeah, that also societies change and that it's important to keep, um, to, to keep having that discussion and that sometimes it also helps to, to sort of take politics out of it and just listen to everyday people's stories um, and, and let that flow into the conversation. And then I believe you have one last. The last example. Okay, this is the last example and then we go to questions from our audience. So start preparing your questions, guys. <laughs> okay, so the last example that we don't have a picture of. <laughs> So we, we can, oh, we do have a picture of, uh, <laughs> because I sent it to Carol last night, yes. Um, so the last, the last uh, example has to do with uh, a, another constitutional referendum, which happened in Chile last year. As you know, uh, Chile's constitution has this provision that says that if you want a new constitution for Chile, you have to have a referendum for it. And it was a uh, very, it was, it was out there, no? It was, it was very polemic, it was very um, interesting, I'd say, uh, because as you know, the constitution that Chile has right now is the Pinochet constitution, right? Which is not very um, human rights centered, let's say, and it's not the best constitution that, I mean, it's not the constitution that you wanna have. But the problem was that, well, there was um, a new constitution drafted, but this constitution had to be approved by the citizens, and so at the end of the voting, 62% uh, of the voters rejected this constitution. What does that mean? I mean, it doesn't mean that they love the Pinochet constitution, which is something that we need to make very clear. It's not that Chile is so uh, conservative. The problem was that they just didn't want this constitution, right? They want a new constitution. They're not cool with what this proposal for a constitution uh, said. So basically what's happening is there's a new commission that's drafting a new uh, constitution that will then be subject to a new referendum and we hope that it will be approved. But this is a very powerful example of how much um, power the citizens can have in a country, right? So they, they cannot have a new constitution if they don't agree upon it. So I think it's a, it's a very, interesting and a good example of how um, direct democracy <laughs> happens when it really comes, you know, like from the bottom up. And I think that's it, no? So let's go with questions from our audience. Who has a question? Yeah, let's go with, with the non-Daniel <laughs> part of the <laughs> audience, please. <laughs> okay, <laughs> excuse me, my work in English. Um, it's just a comment. The idea of referendum is very interesting, and from what I saw, it was a, present, a presentation of the mechanisms of silence and participation, which all the university we were able discuss in Mexico case, a case of the revocation of mandate or the popular consultation. 
but, but from quite the south and I was able to understand that the presentation a series of cases were carried out in Europe and, and Latin America. Perhaps I would go not say that this mechanism, mechanism uh, can be an approximation to the liberative democracy. But if, if it, <laughs> if it is intended to carry out activities that go beyond the consensus involved it, uh, in a vote, but in an opinion that can affect public affairs and I seek a solution to the various conflicts. Well, uh, <laughs> that is technique. <laughs> Thank, Thank you very much. Um, are we, are, do we have any other questions? Okay, so I, if I can reply to that. Um, I think one of the main ideas of this panel is that the mandate recall or the revocation de mandato is not exactly a direct democracy mechanism in the way that it does not deal with a substantive issue. So one of the first things that Ina said is that direct democracy, I mean, I'm not saying that it is not a democracy uh, mechanism, it's just not the, the subject of, of this panel. Um, direct democracy needs to deal with substantive issues. That means popular votes on persons and parties for example, recall procedure are not included in the definition of this panel of direct democracy. But of course, the Mexican mandate recall vote that we had last year is a very important example of both the good and the bad aspects of direct democracy. And I think we could have a complete panel about what happened. And there's a lot of opinions. Uh, we, can, we can talk about it outside if you want. Uh, but I think that, I mean, that, that's one of the main reasons that we didn't choose it as an example for, for this panel. But thank you very much for your participation. I, I have another comment to that, I'm sorry. Um, because you, you said something about the consensus, but of course the goal of a good direct democratic tool is to know what the consensus is or to know what the citizens think. And it is, it is essentially different from, from like doing an opinion poll and asking people what you think about this because the point of direct democracy tools is also to go into argumentation, is to talk to each other about something. Um, it's like, like for example the CARE initiative in, in, in Switzerland, I think it moved a lot of people's minds on what they thought about the healthcare system. So the point of direct democracy is not just to know what people think about something but also to get people talking to each other about what they think about these issues and then to reach a consensus. So you need good direct democratic instruments to, to come to a good consensus. No, I'm sorry. So my question is uh, to the Mexican city case. And there is, of course, uh, very often if, if um, direct democracy tools are newly introduced, um, uh, legislators think about what can happen if there is, for example, uh, a proposal against human laws. And as you said, Greta, you are also in favor not to have such things. And uh, we can connect this probably to, to what Ina told us about Bavaria. There also, um, uh, it can be rejected, a ballot initiative, by the argument it goes against certain things, for example, the human laws, or it's against the authority Bavaria can decide on. That's essentially not a bad thing. What is very essential then in the second step, and I, this seems to be forgotten in Mexico City, that this can of course, or should in Bavaria and in Germany, can of course be um, brought to the uh, Constitution courts. They, they can then uh, decide as judges, is the parliament and, and the uh, minister of interior in Bavaria misusing his um, stop sign or not? So this would be a very good reform for, for Mexico City probably, and I wanted to ask you whether you think it's correct. Um, that it's, it's good that there is a possibility to stop a ballot initiative, but it has to be uh, ruled out wisely, and I think the wisest thing is uh, like it's, it's done in, 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 also in Switzerland. If there is something against human rights, they cannot go on. Uh, that's very, very, very important. In, in California, they decide after the referendum. This is very stupid. So 
after the referendum is uh, decided by the people, then it can be brought to the uh, constitutional courts and then they can say no. This is, of course, very strange and frustrates many people. But I just wanted to ask you whether uh, this could be um, somehow um, um, a healing idea for the process in Mexico City. So, because it's, yeah. Yeah, I think, I think you're right. I mean, like we could, we could go that way, but I think the main problem with the law in Mexico City is that legislators were afraid of really like losing the power, right? So they were like, okay, we're gonna give the citizens the right to start referendums, but then we're gonna like check whether we like the referendum or not, right? So, I mean, it, it cancels out, right? So I think, I think that is one of the things that we need to change, no? Because we, in Mexico City, we're very proud that our constitution is like super progressive and it has a lot of, it has crystallized a lot of rights that in other parts of the world don't even exist. So for example, we have the right to human mobility, no? That means that transportation should be nice to everyone and that you should be able to ride your bike on the street without people yelling at you, okay? We have that in the Constitution, it, not in reality, but we, we have that in the Constitution and we're very proud of it, right? We have a very feminist Constitution, we have a lot of things that are like super, like maybe ahead of their times even, but that doesn't mean that in reality they, they crystallize into rights, no? So for example, in the Constitution we have the right to have a referendum, but then the law that is supposed to make that happen is this law that cancels it out, no? So I think it's, it, it will take adaptation and it will take time to get these mechanisms going, but what I'm like, and, and what Olin is trying to do is to get people to know what is in the law and try to use it, no? So for example, let, let's make a referendum, guys, no? Let's see how easy or how hard it is to make a referendum and then we have the facts and then we can go to the Congress and say like, hey guys, you need to change this. No, you need to make this actionable. That's not going to be so easy because we know they're afraid, right? But that, that's, that's kind of the way that we're trying to do it. But if, if you wanna join the movement, <laughs> you're very welcome. <laughs> yeah. Are there any other questions? Um, what is the future of your like, democracy and what, what kind of issues or topics we will see in the future of referendums or plebiscite? Yes. Future. That is a super difficult question. <laughs> uh, so you were asking what, what kind of issues will come to the initiatives in the future? Yeah, yeah. And they actually have the same like what, what happens after the referendum and, and what they expect in the future. Well, okay, this is a very tough one. Well, <laughs> as from a German perspective, I would say we're not even at the point of direct democracy because we don't have it at the federal level. So I would say the first step for Germany is to bring direct democracy to the federal level because we have it in all the states, we use it in some of the states, in some of the states the um, legal, um, yeah, the laws are quite bad. So as for example in Northern Westphalia where I live, the hurdles are so high that we don't, uh, we have like three citizens initiatives in 60 years. So yeah, it's, it's very bad. But I think the first step is to bring um, direct democracy to Germany and I think then, um, I think we need to strengthen the um, global um, democracy. Like we need to bring a direct, like real direct democracy, like citizens initiatives, then the next step to the European Union, which is like um, confederation of different European states. And then yeah, maybe we have at some point global direct democracy because some issues like climate change, uh, climate protection um, is an issue that uh, yeah, affects the whole world and we can only solve it, we can only work against is when all people work together and to get the acceptance for different measures to protect the climate, we need the acceptance of all people and I think we can get this acceptance by 
um, letting all the people decide on what to do, letting all the people say by themselves, okay, I by myself, I agree on reducing driving by car, reducing whatever. So um, yeah, this would be, it's, it's a very long future, but this would be my, my hope. I, I would say, I would go further. I would say direct democracy is the future um, because like when you look, no, but when you look at the numbers, like voter turnout is in decline in a lot of places around the world. People, people switch parties. You don't have people anymore who vote, who, who are like, I don't know, I'm, I'm Christian Democrat for my entire life. And, um, you know, I have the pin and the flag and the, and the everything. Um, people, you know, every, every election, people, you know, look at the pamphlets. People, if you're lucky, they read the whole program of all of the parties, which I think most people don't do. Um, and they try to figure out which is the party that right now represents me the most. And I think that is a super difficult question to ask of somebody. Even I think even most people in this room who are obviously intelligent people because they picked this workshop, <laughs> uh, um, who are you know who are obviously you know informed people, politically interested. I think most people in this room don't read all of the party programs completely before you go to an election. Um, but what you do know, I think, is when I ask you, you know, do you want better healthcare or do you want cows to have horns or not? Or um, so those are those are easy questions to answer, and they don't require you to be to to inscribe yourself to an ideology or to be part of a party. Um, and I think it's something that fits better to to sort of the spirit of the times that we live in, to to the societies that we have. Um, it's also possible now because, you know, a lot of people have phones, we have internet, like people are more informed, people have technological tools, you can, I mean, I can, I can, you know, I could send a question right now to all of the people who subscribe to the Democracy International newsletter and know if they want less or more emails from us, you know, so I, a government can also do that or, <laughs> or less, right? <laughs> Much less. I, but I'm not going to ask that because I don't want to know the answer. Um, um, so, so, so I, yeah, I think, I think we, the logical way for us to go is more direct democracy. Unfortunately, in a lot of countries, we are seeing things move in the other direction. But I think that that is also a reaction of, of, of sort of elites trying to hold on to power, which they feel that they are losing. And, and that's where we come in, where, you know, all of us in this room come in. And that's, that's our job now to make sure that we move towards more democracy and that we, we move towards a democracy that works for citizens and that works for us. Yes, and adding to that, I would say a more informed direct democracy, like where people really know what they're voting on and what they're like saying their opinions on. Because I mean, we've seen this, no? It's very easy to manipulate and it's very easy. I mean, I, I, I know, for example, that in Switzerland they try to, to, to be like super objective and then they said, no, that every, every person who is supposed to be voting in, in a direct democracy uh, thing in Switzerland gets a booklet with all the arguments uh, for and against, right? Here in Mexico, it's more like you look at Facebook and, and Facebook tells you what to do, right? So I would say like a more informed participation on direct democracy would be a very nice next step, no? We have a question. Yes. Este, y yo solo quería preguntar es, eh, cuál es eh, bueno, en particular tu visión de que tiene, porque actualmente a nivel federal el Instituto eh, Nacional Electoral lleva a cabo la democracia representativa y la democracia directa ¿Usted cree que es necesario que se que vea cada quien eh, que haya un instituto para la democracia representativa la democracia directa y para la democracia participativa o, o cuál es su, su posición con respecto a que el INE se, ten, tenga centralizada una buena parte de funciones ok, so translation on that muy buena pregunta, translation on that very very good, and good question so he's asking, in Mexico right now we have an electoral authority that's called INE and INE is in charge of representative democracy and we are starting with direct democracy and participatory democracy. So his question is, should this remain under the, um, under the, the, the wing of INE or should we have another independent institution that deals with participatory democracy and direct democracy and we leave INE just with elections? Es una muy buena pregunta. Eh, 
en este momento yo sí creo que tanto el INE como los soples deberían de estar encargados de todo lo que tenga que ver con participación ciudadana, incluyendo la democracia participativa y directa, por un millón de razones, empezando porque eh, nuestro sistema electoral, como dije, está basado en la desconfianza. Eh, entonces, para tener certeza de cómo se llevan a cabo esos procesos y de, la, y, y de los resultados de los procesos, me parece importante que en este momento sean el INE y los OPLES. Sin embargo, no estaría en contra de buscar un, un, un sistema diferente en el futuro, siempre y cuando sean órganos autónomos y sean órganos que nos generen esa misma certeza. Now in English. So I just said that uh, right now I think that it's okay that the electoral authorities, both at the national and the local level, are dealing with all types of democracy. But I wouldn't mind having like new institutions as long as they remain autonomous and that we can be certain that the results are the results and they have not been manipulated. Yes. My question. Questions, oh. comments. About Chile, <coughs> Chile is a deeply split society so far, I know. And uh, <coughs> as I saw the proposal for the change of the constitution, uh, firstly, I had the idea it's too much they want at once. Maybe, was that the main reason? Well, <laughs> this is a very complicated uh, question particularly for someone who is not from Chile, but what I have heard from my Chilean friends and from what I read is that the constitution was too ambitious. No? They wanted to change too much in like, like this, no? in, in, in few time. So that's one of the main reasons that people said like, no, no, come on, no? we cannot go from, I don't know, believing like we should all, like women cannot wear pants to, you know, like, uh, I don't know, something like women can have abortions, you know, like all the time or things like that, no? So it was, it was too radical. Uh, so I think that's why a lot of people said like, no, we, we want to move a little bit to the left, but not so radically, no? But I mean, yeah, <laughs> I think we have another comment. <laughs> Um, with all, uh, all these observations and comments, I would like to ask um, what would be the first step to improve the referendum of the plebiscite, just in general? In general or in Mexico City? In general. Ah, perfect. Carol? <laughs> okay. Um, so I. I think, well, the first step is to know what is a good instrument, right? And so um, in, in our typology, as Ina said, so there's, there's this thing, right? So citizens can initiate the process. It doesn't come from the parliament or the government because they, they already have the power to make laws. They don't need to ask the people if they want to implement the law. So, so the first step is to have processes that can be started by citizens. I have an idea, and if I can convince enough people that this is a good idea, then we will all vote on it. Um, so I think to have this, this sort of pillars, like the citizens initiate the process, the citizens decide in the end. Um, and then, yeah, I think it's, it's all of these things that what Ina said, it's the quality control, right? It's, um, it's all in the nitty, the nitty gritty details then. Um, like, yeah, how many people have to tur turn out and vote? For example, in Slovakia, uh, is Slovakia or Slovenia? <laughs> it's Slovakia. Uh, in Slovakia, they have a very high turnout quorum. I believe 60% of people have to take part um, for, for it to be, uh, for a referendum to be valid at all in Slovakia. And which of course means that if I'm against the, the question on the ballot, if I disagree, I'm not going to tell people to go and vote no. I'm going to tell people to stay home. I mean, <laughs> I'm going to tell people don't go because if they don't reach 60%, then nothing happens. And so you don't know if the people who didn't show, if they're against the question or if they're just not interested. Um, and then there's, for example, the, the, budget, um, the budget proofing, so which is something that they do a lot in Germany, which is also this little small detail that makes a big difference. Uh, okay, just making sure what uh, Karen was uh, talking about. Yeah, because um, on the local level and the regional level in uh, my home state, North Westphalia, we have this thing called, um, it's like, how do you call it? 
Yeah, estimation, estimation of the bot itself. Um, we have direct democracy on the local level. Um, it's vividly used. We have kind of good um, law for that. But uh, if you want to change something, for example, you want to build a new school because you know, uh, oh, there's our schools are too crowded. I want to have a new one. I want to have one where all children can go and learn together. Um, but at first, you as the initiative um, needed to come up with an estimate cost of how much would it cost to build the school that you had to come up by yourself. Now it's changed that the, um, um, that the city needs to come up with this estimation, but still it, it, took, it took too much time. And I think um, this kind of cost need to be uh, printed on, the, um, on this, um, the sheets where you collect the signatures on. So in Germany, we don't have digital signature collection. It's all pen and paper. And um, so on this paper, you have the question on demand. So do you want to build the school? Then you have some reasons so you can um, just write them down, like the other schools are too overcrowded, the other schools are too far away. And so you can say, um, yeah, you, you just name some of your arguments for your demand. And then you have to print down how much it will cost. So that people that sign into the initiative they see on the first uh, eye side, okay, well, this school costs, I don't know, five million dollars. Uh, and then they can say, oh, no, I don't want this. And we as um, Demokratie, we said that um, the cost should only come into play when it comes to the referendum, to the voting part, because they, well, I think they are not, the, the cost should not be the argument for or against something, or at least not in at the case of signature collection, but only when it comes to vote. Thank you. Thank you. I Are think there other questions or comments? Then I want to say one last thing. We have the human right to direct democratic participation. It is in the, in the United, uh, United Nations Charter of Human Rights, not just representative, dem uh, representative democracy, but also direct democracy is our protected human right. So everybody in this room, has the right to directly participate in decision making. So, you know, keep that in mind. And <laughs> <laughs> Thanks a lot.